morning, and welcome to Could You Clarify, the podcast where we take your questions you may have about pastor sermon, and we break them down to help you better understand the concepts. Now, this week, we were in a message called Jesus, the man, the message, and the miracles. Mm -hmm. And we just finished up a message called Joy to the World, and in a lot of ways, they are connected. Can you kind of tell me what this message is going to be about? Well, what I did with uh, the whole Christmas season was I took Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, where it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us the son is given, and then the government shall be upon his shoulders. So what we did was we looked at the birth of Jesus, and then Jesus coming physically as king. And so in the context of the second message, we talked about when Jesus literally comes back to the earth and rules as king over the earth. But the kingdom of God actually came in Jesus when Jesus came. So we're talking about the invisible kingdom and the kingdom of God versus the time when Jesus is literally going to be physically king. Yeah. So this week we talked a lot about specifically the kingdom, where Mm -hmm. it is now, and then Jesus as a person. And I know a big struggle for a lot of Christians is they don't have the motivation to get into the word. They don't have the motivation to desire that relationship with Jesus. And that was kind of something you touched on. How can we get that desire? Like, what would you suggest we do? Well, I think you need to ask the Lord. Because I think it's okay to acknowledge that, okay, God, I'm not feeling it. I mean, I think it's really incredibly important to be honest. I look at David in the Old Testament. If you read the Psalms, that's his journal where he's sometimes complaining and just pouring out his heart to the Lord. So I think the first step is to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I want that desire. Please give me that desire. And then what happens is it's like anything else that's a habit, good or bad. The more you do it, the more you desire it. And so you've kind of got to break through that barrier of the flesh that says this isn't interesting until your mind gets engaged. Like, I'm very interested in the Bible, but I wouldn't be if I went a week without reading it. Yeah. That's something I feel like a lot of Christians, like, I know for me personally, like, a few years back, whenever we were, as student leaders, we were logging what we were reading. We Mm -hmm. were making sure we were reading daily, getting in our word. And it'd be like, I'd miss one day. And that one day would turn into two days. And then those two days, I would look and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to catch up on the reading because I didn't read for the past two days. And now I'm feeling super discouraged and now I don't want to read. Because you stir up the desire. I mean, you stir it up. You really do. And it takes taking that first step, getting in the Word. And I really like what you said about, you know, it's... That, that fleshly desire to not, you know, to not want to have to read, to not want to have yeah. to get in that. And once you get out of the swing of it, it's like, oh, now I have to catch well, up, the, the reading. The and other side like, of that is it's wonderful when you've really been spending time studying the Bible and reading the Bible. And you wake up in the morning and think, I can't wait to read what I'm going to read this morning. And so that's a positive thing. It's, it can work for you as well as against you. you yes. got you got to stay disciplined. A disciple is somebody who's disciplined. And so you do it by faith when you don't feel it. And then the desire increases as you do it. Yeah, because once you get into your word, it's like, oh, I can read. It's, oh, I've been reading my Bible for a month straight. That's, That's right. crazy. Like, That's right. So once you get that desire and once you get into it, it's so much easier. That's right. Now, I've started reading my Bible. I've been in my word. Um I know a big thing we talked about is you have to have a relationship to know someone. Um, and that's something I was looking back on some of the notes I had taken a few years ago. And I had written down specifically um, you have to have a relationship with some, like if you just walked up to you, if I walked up to you and I was like, hey, how's it going? And you're like, I don't know you. You're yeah. not going to be like, yeah, what's up? Yeah. And it's the same way with Jesus. Although he knows each and every one of us, he's not going to be like, yo, what's up? How's it going? Like he's not just going to walk into your life and be like, just right here, you That's know, right. you have to have a relationship to know someone. Um, building that relationship is just continuing to read our Bibles, to pray. Yeah. Is there any other things like, small groups, stuff like that. What are some things that we should get into to help build that relationship even further? Well, I keep thinking of that scripture in Revelations where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he's talking to Christians. And so he's actually inviting us into a deeper relationship. And so in many ways, it's like a relationship you would have with someone on the earth. You simply talk to them. You listen to them. For instance, one of the things that I do a lot that I didn't do in the early days is Many times I just sit before the Lord and just listen, you know, meditate. The Bible says we should meditate in the Word of God, which means to ponder it, to speak it, to just, you know, daydream if you want to say it that way. And so I spend a lot of time just listening. Sometimes we feel like we've got to always be talking. But if you translate that to an earthly relationship, you don't want to be in a relationship with someone who never stops talking. And so prayer is a dialogue. It's you talking to God, God talking to you. David said in Psalm 5, Morning by morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. So sometimes the waiting is where I get the the most 
you know, the sense of God's presence more than even when I'm talking to him. Yeah, that's really good because I feel like that's something we often overpass as Christians too, is yeah. like being able to stop and listen. Yeah. You know, so often we want to be like, God, I desire to get the new job so bad. Yeah. Why, why aren't I getting this job? Maybe you aren't getting the job because you haven't sat and listened to what God wants you to do. And I talked this weekend a little bit about, you know, I believe God puts dreams in everyone's heart. And I saw a great example where somebody showed the, this desert that had no flowers. And then it rained like crazy on that desert. And flowers bloomed everywhere. So the seeds were there. It was just waiting for the rain to really cause it to flourish. And so it's exactly the same way with us. You know, we have dreams in our heart. And when we're in the presence of God, all of a sudden God begins to desire through us. And his desire for what he wants us to do starts to consume us. And his desire and our desire is merged. And that's when life gets fun. Yeah. Now, another thing we talked about is when we're operating as Christians, usually people can tell you're a Christian. Usually, whether that's by your actions, whether that's the way you talk, what does it look like to truly display the kingdom of God so that people do notice? People look at you and they're like, oh, it's a well, Christian. You know, the Bible talks about <clears throat> by their fruit you shall know them. So we have the fruit of the Spirit, which is, it's like Jesus set for a, for a portrait. It's a perfect expression of Jesus' character. So that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is the ministry of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So you've got the character and the power working together. And I think what happens is we, we uh, in the Christian world, tend to do one or the other. People really emphasize the character part, or they really emphasize the, the gift part. And the truth is we're supposed to merge them. We mm -hmm. desire love and follow the gifts of the Spirit. And so I think that's the key is uh, follow his example in his character and his ministry. Yeah, that's really good. Now, usually we pull clips from Pastor Sermon and we play them and then kind of break down those clips further. So we're going to go ahead and play our first clip. The theme of the Bible is Jesus. Jesus is the way into eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. The Bible's got some great moral teaching in it. Good morals will keep you out of jail, but they will not get you into heaven. Good morals can keep you out of jail, but they will not get you into heaven. The only way into eternal life is through Jesus Christ. Okay, so in this clip, you talked about how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, uh -huh. and how good morals may be able to keep us out of jail, but they won't necessarily get us into heaven. Yep. Um, so the first part of that, I want to ask, what does the way, the truth, the life mean? Well, Jesus uh, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he was making the point that, just like Timothy says, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus is the only way to get to the Father. There is no other way to become a Christian, to have eternal life, uh, you know, whether it's uh, keeping the law or being good or whatever. None of those things are going to get you to God. Jesus was saying, I am the only doorway into eternal life. Somebody uh, showed me the example, it's really interesting, where Jesus said, I'm the gate for the sheepfold. And uh, they said that in the Middle East, they, the shepherd will bring the sheep into this pen, and then there's a space, and he will sit in that, that gate. So he is literally the gate. Nobody gets in or out except they pass through him. And Jesus said, I am that gate. I am the way into eternal life. There's no yeah. other way. Now, <clears throat> with the part of that, um, giving our lives to Jesus, does that mean surrendering our whole life? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's another misnomer that um, the Western Christians especially get this idea that we can add Jesus to our lives and then do all the things we want to do. And the truth is, unless you're completely in, you're not in at all. Unless you're saying, Jesus, here's my whole life, my heart, which you know spills over to every part of me, then you're not going to be a, a Christian. A Christian is saying, Jesus, you're now Lord, which just means boss. Jesus, you're the boss of me. I always joke about a little kid when they're three or so will say, for some reason, they all seem to say, you're not the boss of me. And it's kind of this, you know, this whole thing of who's, who's in charge of my life. Well, I think adults are having that same issue. Yeah. When you come to Jesus, you're saying, Jesus, you really are the boss of me or you're my Lord. I'm following you with everything I've got. Now, many times we, I mean, there's still parts of my life that I am laying down, sacrificing sure. constant parts that I'm finding out that I'm like, oh, I haven't fully given this to Jesus. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times we look at Christians and we see, oh, 
from the outside, it looks like all parts of your life are surrendered until you break it down. And then it, it's not. There's still the little part, whether that's in their marriage, whether that's in their personal relationship, whether sure. that's in an addiction. You know, there's little parts where they haven't laid it quite down. Do you think it takes a major revelation to have to lay those down? Or do you think it just takes self-actualization? I think it takes a lifetime. Yeah. Because I've been following Jesus now for over four decades. And what I said Sunday was, you know, I wish we could just say I'm, I'm in the kingdom of God. And so everything is settled. You can give your heart to Jesus in the decision, but then for the rest of your life, every day you're going to face a crossroads. Am I going to follow the culture in this, or am I going to follow the kingdom? So it's a series of decisions every day. Mm -hmm. And like I said Sunday, sometimes I choose poorly, and I pay for it. But it's it's not just one decision. It's it's decisions every day to follow Jesus. Yeah. So another thing you said is good morals keep you out of jail. They won't necessarily get you into heaven. Yeah. So just because I'm a good person, I'm not going to get into heaven? No, the whole whole context there is that only by grace we're saved through faith. And even the faith to receive the grace is a gift from God. Mm-hmm. And so eternal life is a gift. Humility is the ability to receive what you don't deserve. Yeah. And so humility says, God, I cannot save myself. Only you can save me. So by the grace of God, I'm a follower of Jesus and nothing else. You did all the work, and I just received it as a gift. Yeah. Now, another thing that a lot of, I know even just a lot of Christians, especially working with youth, we get this question so often. And that is, Jesus is great. We all know that. If he's so good, why is there still evil in the world? Sure. Well, there's a great parable that Jesus gave about the wheat and the tares. Where he said, you know, a farmer sowed wheat in the field. It's in Matthew, I think 11, but I'm not sure. The farmer sowed wheat, and then an enemy sowed tares, or weeds, <clears throat> with the wheat. And the disciples said, should we go pull out the tares? And the farmer said, no, if you do that, you'll hurt the wheat. And so let them grow together until the end of the age, and then we'll separate them. And so judgment is coming to the world, but not yet. Mm-hmm. This is a season of God's grace. This is a day of the Lord's favor. And he's letting evil and good coexist. The Bible says he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Yeah. Paul said three times, I asked the Lord to remove my, my problems. And Jesus said, my grace is sufficient. And so they grow together. And so at the end of the age, those bad things, those evil things will be judged, but not until then. Mm-hmm. Um, last one with this, um, and it's specifically with surrendering our, surrendering our whole lives. Why do we have to do that? Because uh, Jesus surrendered his whole life and he gave us the example that unless you die to yourself, he said, which is literally give over your desires and your your ambitions and say, Lord, I trust that your desires for me. God's plans for you are bigger than your plans. Mm-hmm. The you that God wants to create is better than the you that you want to create. And so it's trusting that God is smarter than us. God is wiser than us. And as we trust him, his plans for our life really are better. And so it's a matter of trust. Yeah. You, if you trust him, you'll trust him with everything. Yeah. Now we're going to go ahead and play our second clip. Now don't you wish you could just pray a prayer once and say, Jesus, everything in my life, I want the kingdom to come. Now you can do that with your heart. and Say, Jesus, I surrender my heart to you. I want the king li- living in my heart. I want the king ruling in my life. Because he won't do it unless you invite him. But if you invite him, he'll rule through you. But here's the amazing thing about the kingdom of God. Every day it's a choice. Cultures are clashing all the time in my life. How about you? Every day I face something. Culture, kingdom. It's a series of choices that I make every day and so do you all day long. Culture, do that, or kingdom. Sometimes I choose poorly. So in this clip, you talk about how we have to invite Jesus into our lives. It's not just something that he'll just show up one day or yeah. he'll just randomly appear or, you know, I know a big one that a lot of, we used to hear in youth a lot was, you know, Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to barge into your house and he's going to, you know, he, you have to invite him in. He's yeah. not just going to knock down your door. Um, and that comes to a big question of then, is it our choice to accept Jesus or not? Absolutely. Um, I know there's a teaching that says God has decided who's going to be uh, saved and who's going to be lost. And I do not believe that. I do not follow that at all. You know, the Bible is is very much behind the idea that I set before you life and death. You choose. So I think it's a real choice. But I think it's, first of all, a choice to follow Jesus with your life. And then after making that decision, every day you make smaller decisions. You make the big decision and say, Jesus, here's my life. 
but there's something about us that keeps taking our life back. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says we're living sacrifices. And so the, the problem with being a living sacrifice is you keep crawling off the altar. So you're continually putting yourself back on the altar. And so I talked about the kingdom of God coming in your heart. But then in my marriage, I make a decision every time Becky and I interact, whether or not the kingdom is going to rule in that situation. So it's a choice. Am I going to go with my flesh and the culture? Or am I going to go with the kingdom? And every time I choose the kingdom, the kingdom is coming in our marriage. Mm -hmm. Same is true with my money. The same is true with everything in my life. I make the big decision once to follow Jesus, but then daily I make choices to reinforce that in the little things. It's possible to be on your way to heaven and still not let the kingdom be ruling in maybe your relationships or your finances or whatever. So you can have, you know, your heart in the right place and still be doing your own choices, doing your own thing. Yeah, I think that's really good. Um, so when it comes to making that choice, it, it really is just starting of self-desire. It's really realizing the impact that Jesus has in our lives. Because I know like a big thing is like, oh, I can go my whole life and not know Jesus and still be successful. But yeah. you know, that doesn't, that doesn't account for the emotional burdens that come along. That doesn't yeah. count for all the other things that you face in life and how much easier it is with Jesus and right. you know, how vital it actually is. Because you know, whether we see it or not, there's always spiritual warfare going on around us yeah. and we don't see this and with Jesus we're able to kind of conquer that and battle that so when it comes to making that choice I think it's pretty important you know as Christians Preach what we do Preach. yeah um, well I think that's a good place that there we can end um, thank you guys for tuning in, tuning in and we'll see you next week on could you clarify thank you Mary. Good job. thank you, thank you.